Aha, all right. So, uh, welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. Uh, I'm Chris Monsignor, I'm an associate professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. This uh, quarter, together with Jenny Liu, uh, Dr. Jenny Liu, we co organized this uh, transportation seminar. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Peter Kurtz from the city of Portland uh, giving us a presentation on confessions of a traffic engineer. Um, I don't really need his bio because I've known Peter for a long time, uh, but he's the division manager at the city of Portland's signal street lighting and ITS division. Prior to that, he worked at Kittleson where he worked on multimodal projects across the country. Um, he's also an adjunct professor here at PSU and he teaches a transportation uh, signal timing class in the summer and he's founded and sort of co-led our uh, our study abroad program uh, with uh, in DELT uh, with bicycle head engineering things. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter and we look forward to all the, the reveals. All the, all the confessions. <laughs> well, thanks, Chris. Um, I, uh, I, you'll, actually, the bio actually plays quite nicely in my presentation. You'll see elements of that throughout um, the presentation. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, so I. Uh, I am, a, I am a transportation engineer. I, I uh, will talk a little about my background as a part of this presentation. Um, the, the, the confessions part is really the catchy title, right? It's the, uh, the this, uh, this was originally something I submitted to the Oregon Active Transportation Summit, which is coming up in April, um, which, is a, which is a conference I hadn't been to before. But when you're talking about, uh, uh, to a group of folks that are uh, interested in active transportation, bike, ped, transit activities, they don't necessarily, find traffic engineering fundamentals very exciting. Uh, but they know when a, when a traffic signal doesn't work for them. And, and they know when, um, when there are too many bikes uh, for a signal to handle. And that's one of the reasons I start off with the bike box is that um, this, this bike box, this is a good example of traffic engineering that we haven't had as a part of our toolbox, if you will, is something that we've, we now, it's an innovative treatment that we've used in Portland because we have uh, the need f to provide that sort of a capacity for bike traffic at this particular intersection. So I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. I'll talk a lot about level service, the highway capacity mail, which some of you returning from the Transportation Research Board mean and probably heard a little bit about, and then get into where, where is the city of Portland, where are we headed uh, with respect to standards and other aspects of that. So I'll start off with um, the, the classic disclaimer. Um, this I work for the city of Portland, but these views are not widely held within the city of Portland. So this is my perspective um, and, and certainly my interpretation of the policies. So policies are always something that can be interpreted in different ways. So that's, that's kind of the, the art of engineering is trying to figure out what does that policy mean to the design and the operations of a traffic signal or whatever traffic control device you're, you're trying to implement. So the background of, of a traffic engineer. Where does traffic engineering come from? Well, traffic engineering come from my background. I wanted to be a civil engineer because I love bridges. And Golden Gate Bridge is obviously one of those, one of those amazing uh, feats of engineering where you, you just look at it and you marvel at it. And, and that's, that's where I started out was wanting to be a structural engineer, wanting to build bridges because they're, they're fascinating structures. Um, when I got into my curriculum at Oregon State University, it was uh, finding out a little more about what engineers do and, and found that there wasn't a lot of people interaction with bridges. You just work with the structure and you, you identify the size of all, location, of, of all the members and then, and then it gets built. And, and um, the, that didn't appeal to me as much as, as traffic engineering which if you look at the curriculum, it comes from the same area. It's still in civil engineering, and that's one of our challenges as we think about engineering, and, and, and my confession as a traffic engineer is we did not learn the human element that you learn in planning. I didn't study sociology. I studied how steel and how, how concrete works in a, in a system. So that's something that from a traffic standpoint, we lump roads and rail design all those things into civil engineering. And, and one of my arguments is that really tra traffic engineering is more about how people interact with the transportation system and their behavior. And that's really on the sociology side of things. But that's where it is as, as part of the civil engineering discipline. And in civil engineering, when you're building a bridge, 
the number one thing that you're building and designing for is you never want anything to fail. Right? We have some examples of that. Apollo 13, you know, Houston, we have a problem. And, and the Tacoma Narrows Bridge is one that is in our own backyard here. Classic failures. We don't want to repeat those. We don't want to repeat the Tacoma Narrows example. Uh, so that's something that, from a civil engineering standpoint, that's the reason we talk about failure so much. But when you think about traffic and transportation, what is failure in transportation? So I am one of my things that uh, I love about transportation and, and the profession in Oregon is we do the traffic bowl. And so if you've been to the traffic bowl, you've seen the Jeopardy board. We, we actually, uh, I took a screen capture from Jeopardy, but uh, we, we have a traffic bowl. If you haven't been to, you should plan to attend because it's really fun. And we have a tr all questions about traffic. So I'm going to ask you traffic level service 101. So traffic level service 101, the highway capacity mail defines failure as the breakdown of flow. This is the threshold where you reach failure at signalized intersections. Anybody know the answer to that? Come on, what is the failure? What is, the, what is, that, what is that threshold? Stefan, I'm going to pick on my former interns here. Stefan, is it close? 65 seconds? Cade? What's that value? Come on, just guess. It's 80, 80 seconds per vehicle at a signalized intersection. Okay, 80 seconds per vehicle. Now, does that define failure if you're in your car? Yes. Does that define failure if you're a pedestrian? No, it's it's a, it's a se seconds per vehicle. Okay, if you're on your bike, does that define failure? Maybe vehicles or bikes, bikes, vehicles, that's the interpretation sometimes we make. But it's per vehicle. What about buses? What about buses? Buses are the same as any other vehicles. We treat them the exact same. So vehicle is the key word there as a part of the level of service de definition. That's failure. If you're spending more than 80 seconds at an intersection, that's failure as we define it in that highway capacity manual. Is that the right definition? From a policy standpoint, that you have to ask that question. What is the right definition? And that's something that we're talking about. So vehicles are people. In the planet, this is something I never saw in civil engineering. I never saw this in civil engineering. What the question that you have to ask is, are you looking at vehicles or people, I think? And standards that we have from the high capacity mail do not accept 80 seconds of delay per vehicle, but we're not thinking about 80 seconds of delay per pedestrian or, or per, per, for even the person movement capacity of the intersection. So there's the cars lined up, there's the people lined up that are in the bus, and then of course people in the space they need. So if you think about it from a transportation carrying capacity, the bus is going to do a lot better and we've got to think about how we use the space efficiently when we've reached failure. But our standards don't do that. So that's one of my confessions, is that our standards that we're designing for are not necessarily the right ones for our policy. So the other problems with the analysis, and I'll, I'll talk about these and give you some case studies later on, is that we're fail failing to consider, we're failing to consider the completeness of the system. So we look at an intersection, but we don't look at the neighboring intersection necessarily. We look at the intersection and don't look at what's happening just 260 feet away. We look at the peak 15, mean 15 minutes. That means that we don't care about the all 24 hours. We just care about the peak 15 or the peak hour. That's something that's commonly done in the industry and something that I struggled with when I went outside of, uh, outside of Portland. In the Portland area, there are some agencies and metros planning for a peak two hour. And so some of our conversations are around that peak two hour. That's, one, again, one of those planning policy discussions that have to take place is how long is that, how long are you willing to accept that sort of threshold for delay? And then limited tools for engineers. That's one of the other things that I'll, I'll talk about here as a part of the presentation. This graphic from Andy Singer, um, this is uh, something that I came across as I was doing um, more research in terms of how we were looking at those delays and, and, and thinking about how we, how we, treat, um, how we treat cities. And, and this is the engineer in his garden saying, well, this is get rid of all the weeds. It's just rotilling it all up. And, and using that same thing in, in terms of the city is saying, well, this will get rid of all the congestion. It'll just knock down the buildings adjacent to the, the street. 
and, and I'll just widen the, widen the street. And we had some conversations about that early on in my career when I was doing traffic studies of trying to, trying to widen the street, basically taking away existing buildings or taking away the building capacity that, that was there. And I'll give you, again, I'll give you an example of that. So really defining the problem is where you have to start. What is the problem we're trying to define? Is it 80 seconds of delay per vehicle, or is it something bigger than that? And I look to the Climate Action Plan. Really, it's uh, back when I started my career, it was the Central City Transportation Management Plan that the city of Portland has that defines policies that you need to speak to when you're thinking about development and, and, and how you're going to uh, improve the system or accept development. So today's methodology measures don't reflect our goals. That 80 seconds of, per vehicle does not reflect the interest of freight necessarily. Okay? We're not talking about goods movement. We're talking about just vehicles. doesn't really address safety. Safety is something that we have done um, a lot more with in the last five to 10 years. But of course, that 80 seconds delay is not speaking to safety. Um, one of the other goals that comes out of the Climate Action Plan is a 20-minute neighborhood. Um, that's something else that isn't part of that. And then, of course, economic development. Everybody wants to know about what, what is the effect that this project will have on jobs, and that's something, again, that, that we're not speaking to yet. And that's a, that, those are challenging questions. So next quiz. So as, I, as, I, as, uh, as Chris said in the introduction, I do a, I do a class in the summer um, here at, uh, at the university, and so I love to give quizzes to make sure people are paying attention. So this is the next question in your quiz is congestion is, is what? Is this congestion? Is this congestion? Yeah. yeah, this is congestion. This is, when you come out of the train station out of Delft in the Netherlands, that's congestion. I don't know where my bike is. How do I find my bike to get home? That's congestion, right? That's not orderly necessarily. Maybe it's orderly for them. But I always was struck that that's actually congestion. Is that bad congestion? Not necessarily, right? It's not polluting. It's not. Um, it's congestion, but it's not necessarily bad congestion. So here's the quiz. Congestion is a. I just gave away the first part. A bad must be mitigated, right? We must reduce congestion. That's one of the policies of the federal government. Actually, if you look at the U.S. DOT FHWA website, congestion reduction is a, is a, is a goal. B. It's inevitable and a result of poor travel forecasting, underestimating demand. That's a shot to the modelers. Come on. C, something we can build our way out of. That's the Houston, Texas example. Houston built a lot of freeways, trying to build their way out of it. I was in College Station, Texas. We talked to the Houston folks. That was their, mo that was their mo mode of operation. Or D, a tool that can be used to make active transportation more competitive. Or E, D, and the opposite of A, B, and C. Okay. So this is probably the radical answer is E. I would say it's at least, it's definitely D, and it could be E. Okay, thinking about it as a tool, if you think about downtown Portland, you know, downtown Portland, the reason the mode split is so good, the reason it's a great place to take the bus, bike, and walk is that we haven't tried to accommodate every single person that wants to drive into downtown. We've used various tools, and congestion is part of them. And I'll, again, I'll give you a case study example of where we've done that. And actually, it was before I got there, so I'm just representing good work that other people have done. So commentary on the focus of the highway capacity mail is really a, born out of, uh, of projects over the last 60 years. Um, really very applicable in the suburbs if you think about what people want, uh, where most development has occurred. So maybe not as appropriate in the, in the, heart, of the heart of the city. People often moved away, uh, moved to get away from congestion, which resulted in sprawl which obviously is something that we're coming around to and understanding a little bit more about. So we've kind of come full circle in this, and, and that's something that I think the Highway Capacity Mail is trying to address. As I went back to TRB and attended some of their sessions, it seemed like that was something that they're talking about. They're obviously thinking about it in terms of the multimodal level service, which I'll get into a little bit later. But, but certainly, if you read the Highway Capacity Mail and, and do the analyses, pedestrians are still considered impediments to traffic flow. Okay, that's one of the things in the model that uh, if you have pedestrians at present, it's kind of checking a box, then you identify that that's occurring and then you reduce the flow, the saturation flow rate that you have at the intersection. It's also representing that we seconds per delay as opposed to seconds per person. 
pedestrian perspective of delay is not necessarily considered as a performance measure. It's, there's, there's a part of the manual that talks about it, but it's, well, it's something that we're working on in terms of research. And then finally, common practice, I find this uh, even in Portland, we look at opportunities to eliminate crosswalks where possible to make the signal timing work. And essentially, if you think about eliminating a crosswalk in an intersection, you may be asking somebody to cross three, three legs of an intersection. And what does that do to your delay if you think about it from a traveling from point A to point B? So those are all really things that the model is insensitive to and we should really be a calm thinking about as we think about how we design our signalized intersections. So the evolution that's happening, the multimodal service is a first start to that, um, but it really represents the best practices from Florida. Uh, the research for that portion of the chapter was done, funded partially by Florida DOT. The research was done in Tallahassee. Um, not necessarily the same sort of cycling environment that we hope to build in Portland. Um, so the Florida perspective is different than, I would say, uh, the, the Green Lane project or the, the cities that are working on, on this in the, in the major urban cities like Chicago, New York, and Portland. So is this all the engineer's fault? I've talked a lot about the high capacity mail. It's not necessarily all the engineer's fault. Part of our problem is looking at the travel demand model. And the de demand model, we think about the growth of traffic. And, and I did this a lot when I was a consultant when we were doing planning studies. We, we assumed some sort of a straight line growth for traffic. And obviously in the last five to 10 years with the economy and how things have changed and the energy prices, we've seen that straight line growth of vehicle traffic really level off and it's been more fluctuating across what's happening in, in the economy. But, but it's changed and thinking about this, it, we have to think about it differently as we move forward. And one of those questions I'd love to ask modelers is, what is the price of gas in 2030? Do we know that? Do we have any, do we have any certainty that, that that um, the conditions will still be the same for a, a straight line growth. And there's some emerging research that suggests that young people really don't want to drive as much as, as, their, as, their, as their parents. Um, and, and I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I think that as we think, as we think about the modeling, we've got we to gotta start talking about those sorts of things and, and adjust the models accordingly. So as I mentioned, uh, you go, to the, go to the Netherlands, you can find out a lot about uh, what do they do? Um, how do they achieve their 40% mode splits for bikes? Um, they're they're very they're 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 similar in some ways and 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 dissimilar in others. But if you think about it in terms of the Portland context and even in cities in general, a couple of things they do that we try to do. I don't think we do it quite as well. Is they they control land use very very carefully. So that's something that we've done with the urban growth boundary. It's not necessarily national uh, practice, but it's something important that we've done. Um, they really emphasize design over demand. So they, when they think about building a new central city, and this is an example of one that was built um, on the right. It's uh, the Houghton um, Central City. This is uh, where they have um, 6,000 bike parking spaces underneath the train station, very well organized, uh, addressing that congestion problem that I mentioned before. Um, they, make, they don't design for the automobile uh, the way we do in, 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 our, in a lot of our cities. They think about access in terms of making sure that we prior, they prioritize bikes, that they make transit competitive. If you think about going from point A to point B, it's probably faster to get there uh, via transit. And they're driving costs. So that's one of the reasons they, they get people on transit is that the, the costs are slanted towards, towards, drive, towards, a, towards taking, um, taking a train or, or, or riding your bike. So all those things are very good. You probably won't see this sign uh, in the Netherlands. But this is a sign that I found in Toronto. Um, and this is a sign that we're probably not doing a very good job with urban design. Telling pedestrians to obey your signal and have them make a two-stage crossing. That's probably an indication that we're, we're, we're not designing, we don't have the right priorities in mind for making a pedestrian environment <laughs> as safe and, and comfortable as you'd want it to be. So let's look ahead. Let's think about leaving all this stuff behind, what are our measures for tomorrow? And I'll just propose some here. I talked about the first one, of course, is person delay. Um, we could do that tomorrow, actually. We could throw the seconds of per vehicle out the window and say, I want you to get, it, I want you to get the transit ridership. I want you to understand how, how many pedestrians are there as a part of the traffic counts that you do. And I want you to come up with person delay. It's something we could do 
do tomorrow, and I, I would I would ag advocate for that number one. The other ones are are harder, um, but I'll give you some examples of these in the next few slides. System air quality, of course, is something that we model in the future, but don't really have good data on. Seeing people on the street. Now, this is one that uh, I got from New York City at the NACTO conference. This is something that they are actually measuring. They're saying they're not just about transportation, they're about creating good spaces. And so seeing people on the street is actually one of their measures, uh, which, you know, from, a, from somebody that started out with bridges and moving, moving and, and, and going to, you know, signal delay and, and, and delay per vehicle, making that migration from that to person delay is easy. Going to seated, seated people on the street, that's a little bit harder for an engineer to do, but, but I'm getting there. Um, reliable travel times, that's something that, again, reliability um, is, is emerging as, a, as an area. Jobs create, I'm not an economic development uh, specialist, but certainly jobs create. If you think about it, if you listen to the media, jobs is important in this day and age, in this economy. Freight tonnage moved, I love that measure, but how do you get the data for it? And then a place to park, that's the other, that's the other, um, that's the other measure that New York City talks about in terms of residential residential capacity. But they have this document, Measuring the Street, New Metrics for 21st Century Streets. Um, very, very interesting in terms of how New York City is, is taking the tact of, of looking at things differently um, and, and thinking about it more holistically uh, as opposed to having that 80 seconds per vehicle as the sole measure that we use. Um, a plug for uh, work that uh, was done by Portland State, Kittleson, and the Tool Design Group uh, recently presented at the TRB was a uh, Bicycle infrastructure quality of service metrics. Um, we may know a lot about vehicle delay. Um, we haven't looked that far ahead in terms of bicycle infrastructure quality of service, but that's something that they looked at alternative measures as a part of that to the HCM uh, because the HCM bike level service provides, like I said, um, a, maybe practice that's applicable for Florida, but maybe not best practices for what we want to try to do in Portland. So let me give you some case studies of where, where I think we've, the city has gotten it right. And I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to questions as I go through these case, or after I go through these case studies. So this is something that obviously you'll have some perspectives on as, as users of the system. But the Hawthorne Bridge is my favorite example. Um, and again, this was way before I got there. So I really, I, I, uh, I'm, I was just a casual observer. But this is my commute home. And so I'm, I'm I'll, most days I'll be, um, been on the bus recently, but uh, most days I'm in this bike lane. And before they, they, they put this bike lane in and put these stop signs in, um, this was actually, uh, this, this ramp was prioritized. Okay, that ramp was prioritized in terms of the movement. But one of the reasons to make this, to prioritize the, this movement is to make sure that bikes have a continuous, continuous network and uh, have an ability to move through without too much delay. And of course, that's been one of the features that has helped us grow our bike ridership over all the bridges. Uh, there are other improvements, of course, but the Hawthorne one being the, probably the most notable of these four bridges. But it's obviously, if you think about measurements, this is a good measurement to know that we're moving in the right direction, that we're moving more people by bikes than we were before. So, let me just give you that system perspective, taking the aerial view of what, what, that, what that bike movement, make a continuous bike movement um, going from west to east has done. And, and what, is it, what is that ramifications of doing that? So if you think about the ramp traffic here, um, how many of you go through this intersection or have been through this intersection? So what do you think, what, what happens on this ramp when we prioritize this movement for bikes? The queue extends, right? This, this vehicle traffic now has to look, look back to their left and look for a gap and find a gap in order to access the bridge. So that's obviously increased the delay, right? Before it was free flow, no delay. Now the delay, the queue spills back and queue spills back quite a bit, in fact, multiple blocks. So if you think about it, if we applied that high capacity mail procedure, what would that say? It's failure. It's failure. Seconds per vehicle has just gone up. So you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't prioritize the bike lane. 
So if that was your sole measure, that'd be a problem. It wouldn't meet our policy, which suggests that we're trying to grow bike ridership. But if you look at it as a system, as opposed to just looking at that one intersection, when I'm in my car, I will make a left turn, go into downtown, and make that loop. Okay? That's a little tip for you if you're driving. Yeah. Okay. But that would beat that delay going northbound on NATO trying to make that right turn. Maybe, maybe. That, 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 that is, that's not in our policies to take the helicopter. But if you think about that in terms of the, the system, that would then show you that you have an opportunity to bypass that 80 seconds of delay, go through the various intersections, and, and have your, and basically have your cake and eat it too. So we've applied this on Northeast 12th. We had an overcrossing project where the questions became, uh, what is the impact of, of if we take this bridge from four lanes to three lanes? And the question was raised by the, the Franz Bakery and, and a lot of the business owners in, in both sides of the bridge of what is the impact of four lanes to three lanes. And so what we did was said, OK, we'll, we'll study it. And what we're going to do is make sure that these signals on either side are working as well as could be, uh, po could be possible for you. And we're going to measure. We're not going to look at one intersection. Um, we're going to look at the system. We're going to look at a series of intersections and the travel time from points on either side to give you that perspective. And so we measured the performance. And obviously, you see some really good improvements, some um, that were about the same. Uh, but ultimately, that was a part of the communication is, how does this work as a system as opposed to one individual intersection? OK, case study two. Maybe, some of you may be familiar with this. Depends on how long you've been in Portland. But this is one of our uh, uh, exclusivity of signals is one of our new techniques that we've used. Um, and, and this was, a, boy, back in 2009, I believe, 2008, um, this is Broadway and Williams, so if you're new to Portland, this looks different than it did then. Um, for some reason, this was one of our most dangerous intersections. This is the bike lane here. If you look at the lane configurations, we had a right turn onto the freeway and onto Williams. And then to the left of the bike that wants to go straight, we have another right turning movement crossing over the bike lane. Anybody see that would be, why that would be dangerous? And it was one of our worst crash locations. Um, so thinking about how we might solve that, one of the things that we did was look at the intersection. And of course, in our traffic model, this is synchro, our traffic model. So some of you may be familiar with that traffic engineering tool. This was the lane configuration. We had streetcar coming in here, so there were some opportunities to analyze this. And this was actually, again, before I got to the city, but I was working on this as a consultant. So we had this westbound traffic. You'll note that in our traffic engineering tool, Synchro, do you see a bike lane? No, no bike lane. Do you see sidewalks? No. We're not looking at any of that stuff. Okay, this is a traffic engineering tool. We don't care about your walking and your biking. Okay. It's just a limitation of the model. Right? All we're being asked to do is get seconds per vehicle, so we're not worried about any of those multimodal things. So if you think about how do you analyze this bike lane and how would, who in their right mind would put a bike lane in between two right turn lanes? Right? So one of the things that we looked at was changing this. This is Broadway again. And having the two through lanes be here, two right turns be on the right side, and then having the bike lane curb tight which is actually against the rules in the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. You're not supposed to have a bike lane to the right of a right turn lane. Okay. But if you think about that, those rules are based on um, national practice as opposed to the unique situations that we have here. And if you think about the other alternative would have been to have somebody on a bike having to cross two turn lanes, I guess we could have had the bike lane in between two throughs and two right turns. But that feels a little bit uncomfortable if you're, if you're biking for the first time through here. 
So this is what we ended up doing. We did the analysis. The volume to capacity ratio so it show an increase. We didn't study delay because that's what the Oregon Department of Transportation asked us to do. Um, so this would suggest that we shouldn't do it, right? The volume to capacity ratio, one of our other measures, that's kind of a companion to delay per vehicle. That again, and volume capacity, I mean vehicle volume, not pedestrian volume or bike volume. But that would show that, 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 that we're closer to one, which is our at capacity, and actually nearing the design standard of, of, of 0 0.90. But in this case, we use the argument of, look, this is the least safe intersection for bikes throughout the city. Maybe we should try it. And so working with ODOT, they allowed us to do that. This is what it looks like today. We have the bike signal. We have the right turn, uh, or the, sorry, the right turn lane to the left of a bike lane. Again, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, but we separate in time with the bike signal. Okay. So we have the right turn separate from the through vehicles. And we turn this on about, oh, I guess over two years ago. And we haven't had a reported crash since. So my argument is my performance measure here is not delay, it's safety. But that's, again, that's one of those things that we haven't, the profession hasn't really found a way to incorporate safety into our performance measures. So case study three, I mentioned the Central City Transportation Management Plan. Um, this, is, this is a document that's been around a long time. Um, and one of the reasons that the Central City is as effective as it is, um, and if it starts at the policy level, it says promote transit to carry 75% of the passenger trips to and through the core, fast, com economic, convenient, and comfortable. Um, that's actually, uh, this is before we had any idea that bikes could carry as much mode uh, percentage as 8% that we have today. So this was kind of the pre, um, the pre, the pre, the before the bike boom, really. Um, in fact, we called bicycles an alternative mode of transportation, which is a, which we wouldn't do that today, right? It's not an alternative mode, right? We hope to increase that bike mode shift, uh, bike mode split to, uh, to as much as 25%. Uh, so that, that's, that wouldn't be an alternative, would it? It'd be, uh, it'd be near the majority, right? So, and then also, of course, uh, maximum accommodation to walking to the core. So the Central City Transportation Management Plan in the city of Portland provides the bones as an engineer to decide exactly what I should be doing in the downtown core. And ODOT um, has provided some similar language that they call multimodal mixed-use areas. So ODOT has done some work in this area, which is, which is really good, that starts to lay the groundwork for how one might look at uh, different performance measures. So if you think about moving forward, this is really, this is, there, is, there is a way forward for both within the city and then also at, at the ODOT level. Um, as I mentioned in the early part of my career, we had some discussion about um, a traffic study in downtown Portland. That's actually now the ODS Tower, right at Second and Alder. And one of the, as we were looking at the bridgehead, we noticed that traffic backs up on Alder during the PM peak hour. So one of the alternatives was to add a lane there. And the developer said, well, if you're adding the lane there, and if you do the math on the amount of square footage that that would take out of the building of that 24-story building, think about the economic development impact that had. Um, it was pretty quickly clear that that was a political decision that we were going to have to relax the standards and allow that building to occur. And, and that, that was obviously the right decision. If you think about it, in downtown, how much density do you want downtown as opposed to that mean that 80 seconds of delay standard that, that you had um, as a part of our traffic analysis review. So where do we go from here? Um, we are actually, the city of Portland is actually as a project underway to look at performance measures, really trying to identify how we would change those performance measures. So I'm, I'm excited about that project. I'm, a, uh, I'm, a, I'm just a steering mem a mem committee member for that. So we're going to try to figure out how do we go from where we are um, considering there's been some uh, discussion about even parking requirements. We've, we had no parking requirements um, for, some of our, uh, for some of our projects. How do you incorporate parking as a part of the measures maybe you use? And that's, as I mentioned before, a place to park is something we have to think about 
um, as a measure because that's important to the community and the, the community that's already there. Um, so that's, that's really, level service is obviously one approach, um, but the question is, is that the right approach? And, I, and that's, that's obviously um, the question that's on the table, and, and I'm very curious of what you all think in terms of your measures, because obviously we get a lot of our a lot of our good ideas from the university and 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 um, and from across the country. So we're we're very very interested in your thoughts on this as well. So with that, I'll I'll stop, and I'll open it up to questions and uh, uh, see if I can't uh, see if I can't answer any of your uh, any of your challenging questions. Yeah, the comparison of the modes is really is really a challenge for us. Um, we we don't think we don't we don't often think about the the notion of how that how that plays out in terms of cost benefits. Um, as I think about um, as I think about the life cycle costs of things, um, one of the challenges we have at the city of Portland is, look, uh, if you're on your if you're on your bike, you're not paying any any tax for that particular use of the transportation system, right? So you may, and, and I'm, I'm in this camp, I'm, you know, I, I live in the city so I can bike to work. My argument is I pay more property taxes than I would if I was outside the city. Um, so shouldn't my property taxes go to the transportation department? They indirectly do through general fund transfers, but we don't capture enough of our, of the revenue in terms of transportation to make that case that the trade-offs bike versus cars really, really fits our sustain, uh, sustainable funding scenario. So we, we have to really think about how, as a transportation agency, we make that cost benefit. My, my argument is that um, you can make that case if you think about what pavement costs and, and all the various aspects of it, but we have trouble right now with, with the, 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 that cost benefit. We can, I can do a lot of different things to get, provide benefits to the citizens of the city, but I don't necessarily see any uh, reduction in, um, in cost for the city. So it's that, you know, that you're, I can give you a, the best cost benefit ratio in the world, but it's got to be a, it's got to work for a, from a political standpoint and also from a sustainable funding solution. Other questions? Yeah. For tomorrow, right? And I'm wondering, do you think the the uh, reliable travel time for transit should be same with the one for the automobile, or or do you think what's the relative travel reliable travel time for transit or bike compared to the automobile? Oh, I think the reliability of transit's um, it's really key. Uh, if you think about the the nature of scheduling and, and, and the importance of um, trying to get people to to take the bus. I mean, if you think about the the downtown as a, as, as still trying to achieve that 75% mode split, which we're we're quite a ways from, reliability is is, is a key. Um, I think the other part of that is, uh, in addition to reliability and comparing the two modes, is also competitiveness. Um, I was on the train to Hillsboro yesterday, uh, from Hillsboro to city of, from the Hillsboro. Uh, city of Hillsborough doors to the city of Portland. It was it was it was almost an hour by train. Um, I I could have I could have driven. Um, the competitiveness of, of transit you gotta you gotta think about that as well. Um, so my suggestion is you know let's okay let's in, in the train just as easy as that just add add you know skip stop spacing for trains. That's that's really easy to do right. Um, it's not it's not it's something that we have to think about. Um, and how we how we make transit more competitive is is a is a key part of that, but reliability is also key. Um, but but from a freight standpoint, obviously, freight needs reliable goods movement. So um, that's that's important as well. And how we get there, that's that's a good research question for all of you to try to how do we get data that would support 
um, the decisions that we're making. There's a couple of comments in the, or questions in the front. Um, I had two questions. One was, what do you see as the future of bike boxes with the fatality last year? And if you think they're a safe design um, by their nature. And the second question is, is there, for the, in, this in relation to the blue uh, trigger for the bicycle, you know oh. what I'm talking about? Uh, is there any plans to make that widespread? Way two uh, pretty, pretty uh, different questions. But uh, the bike box. So the bike box, um, you know, I think the, we're learning a lot about the bike box um, applications, obviously, as a part of that. It's not um, something that I'm uh, in charge of. I'm, I'm the signals guy, but I know there's some work going on in terms of how we make bike boxes uh, as effective as possible. Um, I think one of the questions, of course, that you probably heard read about is this notion of how speed um, figures into that, and then um, how how essentially people are able to see what's happening on the street, and and so there's there's that part of it, um, and so I, I guess from a bike box standpoint, I think there's great applications. I mean, they use them quite extensively over in Europe. Um, I think we we're, we're sorting that out to try to make sure that that's that that it's uh, we're we're putting them in at appropriate locations. Um, the second part of your question, the blue light, I can speak to that. That was actually uh, one of our little innovative uh, things that we said. Oh, let's try that. Let's see. Let's see if folks figure that out. Um, and and uh, so we put in a. So for those of you that aren't aware, we have a. Um, as you pull up, one of the problems if you're on your if you're on your bike, you may not know that you've been detected. So one of the one of the things that we decided was, well, let's let's give a positive indicator that that that's occurred. So. If you're pulling up, you're, you can put your bike on the stencil. We're gonna we're gonna tell you they've been detected. We've done that with uh, pedestrian push buttons. The newer pedestrian push buttons have those little red LEDs in them that tell you, yes, I've been detected. So why not do that for bikes? And so we've done that. Um, we got really good success with that. Good feedback. Um, Bikeportland.org is a good source to get comments. Um, people seem to like it. We're just looking for new opportunities to do that at. If you have ideas, um, feel free to tell us. Um, Via either 823 cycle or uh, uh, 823 503 823 CYCL, we'll we'll look at those opportunities. It's pretty cheap. It's an off-the-shelf thing that we've uh, we've just uh, wired to the existing equipment that's out there. Yeah. Uh, so you referred to something called a 20-minute neighborhood, yeah. but I've never heard of that before, and I was hoping you could uh, elaborate a little bit. Yeah, um, so 20 minute neighborhoods, thinking about it in terms of uh, each neighborhood uh, being able to walk within a 20 minute of a central um, commercial area so that you can get. Uh, Charlie Hale is actually our mayor, um, uh, used to talk about um, being able to send your uh, children out to go get uh, a gallon of orange juice. Because, you know, convenience stores aren't, maybe aren't the best place where you can get everything that you need. So he was kind of talking about more grocery store-ish, you know, so 20 minute neighborhood being able to walk within that sort of a threshold so that we, it's really completing the neighborhood so that you don't necessarily have to drive everywhere that you would um, need to to go to, to get all your daily shopping done. So kind of thinking about in terms of complete communities, that's the 20 minute neighborhood as I can best describe it. Jennifer. Hello. Oh, that was a tough question. Here we no, go. Got to get ready. A bigger picture. So uh, I really appreciated you starting out with the concept of failure, and that was clearly yeah. a theme throughout. Um, and I think the contrast is your first examples of the Tacoma Narrow Bridge and the Apollo 13. Failure is its death. That's bad. Um, and 80 seconds is clearly not on par with that. And um, you know, it's really. <laughs> Even if it's 80 seconds of delay for a pedestrian or a bicycle, I mean, it's just not quite the same thing. Um, and it's hard to argue that what's the real difference between 79 seconds and 81 seconds. And, you know, the, it's just a little different. Um, and so I think in traffic engineering, um, safety, death, injury is failure. And I'm just wondering if um, you're seeing any movement within traffic engineering to get away from that concept of failure because it isn't as cut and dry I, I would say except for safety um, but you know we have this level of service A through F and 
F obviously means failure. Do you see a movement away from that core concept? Um, great question. Um, you know, that's something that uh, at the at the highway capacity committee, I think there was some after the 2000 highway capacity mail came out, there was a lot of debate about that. Um, whether we want to get away from the report card, because everybody says, well, yeah, I don't, you know, if you get a D on your report card, um, that's even more ridiculous, right? And nobody wants a D on their report card, and, and, and we, we use this A through F threshold. Um, and D is, you know, D is perfectly fine. I mean, I, I, there aren't many signals that in the city that actually have level service A or B, but I mean, if you think about back to school, right, all you want A's and B's. Um, so this notion of safety, um, we, you know, Chris could probably talk about this almost better than I can, but we don't have the tools to know if we put in a put in a certain lane or we have a certain width that it'll change the safety um, performance. So our our data on safety is is very limited, and so that's one of the things that I think engineers we've struggled with is the, the and the research has lagged in terms of what is the what is the what is the safest is it, is it safer? Um, you know, the, the examples of uh, of you know clear space. You know, on freeways, right? Well, let's clear out those buildings because that we you know, and clear out the trees next to the street because that's that could be unsafe. Well, no, really, the problem is you're 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 trying to get people driving at 60 miles an hour, and and that's the that's the problem. So, uh, the safety aspects, obviously, safety is related to speed, and so I think there's a, there's an awareness that 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 is a contributing factor. But our the way we set speed limits is um, is another one of those challenges, right? We we go out and measure. Um, what the speeds are, and then we say, well, that's you know, if, if people are driving at 55 miles an hour, that must be, that must be okay. So, if you think about it from a safety standpoint, if you're going to have pedestrians present, then you're you wouldn't do it that way. So it goes, it's beyond performance measures. It's more about the fundamentals of how we design and how we uh, set speed limits. That I would say is where I'd like to see the movement headed. Um, we are doing that obviously in the city of Portland. Um, we're talking about that at the most of the most of the urban areas as we think about um, the differences of um, creating a city and accommodating people that live in the city as opposed to just accommodating people that drive through the cities. So I guess, I don't know if I have a good answer for your question. I, I think there's, there's definitely some talk about that, but I don't think it's as strong as, um, and that's where NACTO, I think the Urban Street Design Guide, we're going to be, I'm on the panel for the Urban Street Design Guide. and and. Um, I see that as a as a really where we have to start talking about that. What is the right what is the right measure to think about design? How do we get to where we want to go? Because we have a lot of these a lot of standards that set us up for not designing what what the what the what the what my what I think the citizens of Portland want. As I've, we've heard it through the climate action plan or even the neighborhoods that we we go and talk to about projects. So um, safety is obviously of paramount importance. I think the research will still will continue to fuel movement in the right direction. Alex? You just mentioned about serving different sets of people with the transportation system. And why do you think it is that we, especially here in Portland, we plan at a regional level and we traffic engineer at a city municipal level? And do you think that's wise? Um, you know, I think there's a certain makeup of, uh, of government structures that just there, there's only so much we can do at a regional level. Although Toronto kind of blew that away when they did the amalgamation, they pulled all the communities together. But that's that's kind of the that's the anomaly, right? Um, and they're Canadians; they're way different than us. Um, but I mean, we 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 absolutely collaborate. I mean, like I was just in Hillsborough yesterday, where we were talking about what we're doing with streetlights. Um, so I, I mean, we. We we talk about these various things. Obviously, each community has their own interests, right? I mean, Hillsboro, the policies in Hillsboro are different than what Portland's policies are. So if you think about the design treatments that we use in Portland, uh, it's going to be different than what's done in Hillsboro. But we talk as a as a region. Um, so I mean, uh, there's only a certain amount of. I have uh, four I call them district engineers that do all the signals, and so one district engineer is doing all the signals in Northeast Portland. That's a it's a pretty big area. I mean, so you can only cover so much of your, so much of the area um, as an individual, um, and we, we collaborate. So I don't know. I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're broken. I don't know if it's. I don't know if that's a broken thing. I think it's it works pretty well. 
but certainly Metro could take a more active role in, um, yeah, there's schools of thought on that. Next question, I don't know if I addressed that question, but <laughs> next question. <laughs> that was too hard, that was too hard. <laughs> Big picture questions. Come on, can we talk about with the lanes and <laughs> seconds of delay? No. No. The third decimal point. Let's talk about the third decimal point. So you were talking about being on a. Is it a committee to uh, look at new performance measures within the city of Portland? Yes. Or? Yes. And um, so you were also talking about uh, it's going to be very important to look at performance measures within a system and not just within intersections, and so that requires that. Um, people from different agencies work together. So are there people from other agencies besides the city of Portland looking at the performance measures? Yeah, yeah, ODOT's a member of that, that panel, obviously. Um, they're a great partner in this, and actually they've done some earlier work that, um, that uh, was done on alternative performance measures, trying to explore how they would work with an agency that wanted to, you know, had a development opportunity that was really of regional significance. Where they would say, okay, yes, we, you know, this doesn't mean our design standard, but we want this development for, for uh, economic development purposes, or we want, you know, some sort of waiver for that. So there's, there's clearly, um, there's clearly opportunities to uh, to look at those things. But it is a, it's going to be a partnership with ODOT, um, and I think we have, uh, I'm trying to think if it's Metro or somebody else on the, on the panel, and we're looking outside. Um, one of the examples um, I found from talking to some other folks is Bellingham. Bellingham's done some amazing work at the regional, at their, at their city level, but thinking of things not just at the intersection level, but thinking of it as a neighborhood and how do, how do those, how, do the, how does the community look at development and then say if that development can be built without looking at each individual intersection. So kind of going away from some of the things that, boy, we've held near and dear to our hearts for a long time. Um, so that's, that's exciting. It's trying to really dig our teeth into this and get performance measures that the, the community will, will be okay with and that uh, can move our policies forward. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, goals and performance metrics, how do you capture mode choice and the mode split that you're shooting for? Well, the easiest way to do that is to um, is to try to design for it, uh, you know. And, and the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail was the was the last project that I mean, it was a major project where we were I was involved in it. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, that Roger Geller, our bike coordinator, did was said, "Okay, this is if we think about this in terms of what the bike demand is, um, let's think about this in terms of like uh, what's happening on 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 the bridge." Um, on the Hawthorne Bridge and see if that applies to the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail, the transit bridge. And then if you start to do that, well then you, you come up with a number that's similar and, and that's kind of the starting point. And then you have to design for that number of vehicles, right? So and we and we've done that for traffic for a long time. We have more sophisticated tools in the traffic side. Um, but certainly think about it from a bike share bike mode split standpoint, it becomes a pretty big number if you think about that twenty thirty goal. And then once you have that number, um, one of the intersections we were looking at is, okay, we have 300 bikes per hour. And then you end up with, well, gosh, I need to have a bike box there because that's a lot of bikes. And how do we accommodate? How do we make sure that that bike movement is, is, um, is prioritized and, and, and fits within the space that we have? So um, from a design standpoint, I'd say, is the easiest way to look at it. Um, and then, of course, the encouragement programs. I mean, we've done a, a lot of encouragement programs. How do you... How do you continue to do those with the with the funding situation that we have? So those sorts of things are, are are challenges moving forward. How do you continue to do what you're doing and 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 do it well with uh, with declining resources? So that's the we we're talking before. This is an economist question of uh, you know doing more with less and if that's possible. Um, so we're looking for ways. I mean, it's a it's it's definitely a, a challenge for us. Back of the room. Uh, to go back to the intersection level, um, if you think about a really busy intersection like Rose Quarter, uh, has the city considered using something like a pedestrian overpass or underpass bridge to cut down on those delay times for people missing trains and missing buses? 
Yeah, it's separating modes is something we haven't done much of. I mean, the um, thing about transit, obviously, the light rail trains were um, uh, actually that that area used to be separate. Um, so the train, the, the uh, not, not the train, but before the trains, there was a lot more freeway ramps through there, and um, so we brought that all up to one level, and that obviously creates some unique challenges for us. Um, but it, if you think about it, it does. It prioritizes pedestrians. It's not the best pedestrian environment, but it it makes the access to transit pretty pretty effective because you don't have to go down a tunnel um, or or go out of direction, if you will. Um, but then it slows down the train, so there's a trade-off there. Um, but our uh, again, with declining resources, we're not looking at much grade separation anymore. It's uh, it's um, it's something that just isn't in our you know in our in our budgets of projects. And we find that you know the pedestrian overcrossings, people just don't use them. Um, we had one at 87th and Division where we just put in a new signal um, to try to provide improved access, but because well, if you're on your bike, obviously going upstairs not so not so good. Um, and and the, the signal was, a, was essentially providing that access that we really needed across the street. Yeah. What happened to the old uh, push button ones? Uh, they, most of them broke and they just come out. I'm bugging them to get a little better one. <laughs> Uh, so a big theme that you've, we're talking about is moving away from just looking at delay or just looking at sort of flow volume capacity. Um, but in countries where they do have real bike congestion, like some of the examples that you've shown, do they use those similar measures for the bikes as well? Um, like looking at you know delay, trying to minimize bicycle delay. And if so, does that help the system overall, or does that have some of the same flaws that we've seen come up with that kind of exclusive focus with cars? And there's a saying in the Netherlands, uh, Rob probably heard this a couple times when he was there, is bikes are like water. You know, they kind of go wherever. Um, so, you know, uh, as we were biking around the Netherlands, the only congestion, the only bike congestion we saw was the group of 30 students from, you know, Portland State and Northeastern that were biking around that couldn't get through all the signals. You don't really see much in the way of bike congestion. And, and Peter Firth, the professor from Northeastern University, he, uh, he's on a search to find bike congestion because it's really uh, bikes kind of sort themselves out, especially in a grid network. If you think about it, um, you know it is interesting. We're kind of getting there at the bridges um, in Portland, but I'd be surprised if anybody sat through a complete signal cycle. So I, I don't know. I, I maybe there's a future of bike congestion, but I, I don't I don't know if I. I mean, the Morrison Bridge is probably pretty lightly traveled still, so that's a good option for you. Um, I, I'll be, I'll, you know, that, that's a that's a different problem. Um, I'll be excited to see that that day, I guess. Catherine, probably time for one more. One more. One up front. Up front, yeah. So you started out your talk saying that you didn't learn in school um, about the sociology or the human element of traffic engineering. And you may or may not be able to answer this, but do you see, I feel like Portland State does a good job of incorporating that into our engineering curriculum, but have you seen a shift um, either with like younger people, younger graduates that you've worked with or? Uh, you know, the, the engineering curriculum is so um, packed with physics and calculus. I mean, I, I think that, um, I still think that engineering isn't round enough. Um, and that, I mean that's okay. I mean I got it when I left school. I think that's the you, you hope that um, in the curriculum and whatever curriculum that you have, you, you're developing a, a lifelong learner, somebody that continues to stay open to learning new things. I mean I learned it by reading books out of the sociology aisle at Powell's, right? I mean it's uh, urban studies books um, was really where and, and going to Texas and and living in College Station, Texas, and saying, wow, this isn't like Portland. Um, I like Portland. I like it a lot. Um, you know, so having that sort of experience where you're a fish out of water and, and, and harassed by be a, when you're on your bike or walking because you're not in your dually pickup truck. I mean, it's it's that sort of uh, life experience, and then reading about well, why why would th why would a city be like that, and why what are the different models that are out there? Um, that's that's I think that's you hope that um, by creating by by having that experience within the curriculum that you're continue to learn as throughout your career. So I guess that'd be the biggest and best piece of advice I'd give you is still um, you know, be open to new things and, and, and explore things by uh, 
by reading about them and, and uh, learning as you go. Good, good way to end it. All right. Uh, thanks, Peter. <laughs>